Do sleeping wharves dream of elves? Or does it, is it the right way, the other way around? In fact, because it, because oh, you know, dream about Gimli, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. There's who something in it. Who doesn't? Yeah. I mean, you've seen that picture of Gimli with a beard and all that stuff. That is what young women want to wake up next to in bed in the day, at the, you know, in the morning. I think so. That, yeah. that, that ravishing red hair, you know, the, the little bit of soup and crumbs <laughs> that get in there. Oh, I love to pick him out. Oh, dear me, Gimli. Oh, you sexy old beast, you, they say. They do that all the time. You know, uh. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, to Nerd of the Rings. Today, we are celebrating Doran's Day. And what better way to celebrate the biggest holiday for the dwarves than war welcoming the greatest dwarf of all dwarves, Gimli himself, Mr. John Rhys Davies. John, thank you so much for coming back to the channel today. My pleasure, my pleasure. Gimli is always there, <laughs> representing the dwarves. That's right, yes. And alongside Gimli, we've got John Paul Dumont from uh, the brand new game, Return to Moria, which is all about dwarves. And uh, we thank you, John uh, Paul, who has also been on the channel before. Thank you as well for coming back. Yeah, so happy to be here. Now, uh, the big news, of course, is that uh, Mr. John Rhys Davies is returning to the role of Gimli for the Return to Moria game. Um, first, I'm gonna I'm gonna start off a little off topic here because uh, John, I have to congratulate you because you lied right to my face last time you were here about being an Indiana Jones, and I'm so <laughs> glad that you were <laughs> because when I heard your voice in that trailer, I got immediately excited and i said i said to my wife sitting next to me i said i knew it <laughs> well i you, you know what contracts are and you know how yes. miserable, miserable some big film companies are um they didn't they wanted to keep it a secret yeah actually they kept it so much of a secret that actually they left my name uh, 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 and Marion's name off off the uh, poster. You'll notice we're not even oh. mentioned on them. Yes. So um, anyway, so much for uh, for uh, for the poster for the fifth one. Yeah. Uh, am I allowed to talk about? It? I don't think I'm allowed to talk about it. We're still on strike, aren't we? Yes. Anyway. Oh, right. Okay. Well, we'll well. Hopefully, you won't be on strike here in a couple weeks when we air okay. this. <laughs> okay. Um, now. Uh, we j we actually joked around a little bit, John, last time you were here about you returning to the role of Gimli. You kind of joked, now you know, now I kind of want to play the role all over again, and uh, and now here we are welcoming you, welcoming you back to uh, talk about you doing just that, where you're voicing Gimli again. Mm -hmm. So what's it like to revisit this mm -hmm. uh, this iconic role, you know, twenty plus years later? Well, Gimli is never far from me, is it? He, is he? I mean, he's right. he's, uh, he's he. Every fan I meet uh, loves Gimli. Um, he is a very popular character. Yeah. I was thinking about him the other day, and why? And the, the truth is, I suppose that he is the most human hmm. of all the characters. You know, he. All the characters are a little bit unflawed. Mm. They're a little bit, you know, they don't really, there's nothing, there's nothing really wrong with, uh, I mean, the elf is perfect, as we know. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and there are many, you know, there, there are many wonderful characteristics about the hobbits, but they're all, they're all really, uh, they don't have the human flaws that Gimli mm. has. Gimli, Gimli is is all our really bad things, you know, the aggression, the hostility, the xenophobia, you know, the belligerence, um, and all the things that we hope that we could be, mm. you know, the capacity for friendship, the loyalty, the willingness to trust and 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 protect those more vulnerable than him. Yeah. And also, I suppose the greatest characteristic of all is he is willing to, he is able to change. 
his rigidity is actually challenged and and he does change his mind about the elves in particular yeah uh, and perhaps adaptability is 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 one of the things we most should be preparing to do ourselves because the world is changing and values are changing society is changing yeah i also hmm. love that you know gimli seems to have this appreciation for beauty as we see with you know galadriel glittering cave stuff like that um it kind of you you don't expect it from this gruff exterior that you get from a dwarf but they they do have an appreciation for beauty which i think is, is yes. another nice thing yeah yes, yes they do um now, but it's wonderful it's wonderfully ironic yeah. isn't it you know that that it actually he he warns you know you know there's a witch that lives in these yeah. woods and they say that Anyone who ever sets eyes upon her is never the same again. Yeah. And that's exactly what happens to him. Yeah. He falls deeply and irrevocably in love with her. Mm -hmm. Now, John Paul, I'm curious, you know, at what point in the development of the Return to Moria game did you guys decide to bring the character of Gimli into the story? And then you know, I'm, I'm guessing at some point after that, you guys said, hey, what if we got the Gimli to be yeah. in the game? Yeah, well, we, when we first started to think about what would Lord of the Rings be with survival crafting and how do we put those together, we kind of hit on, oh my gosh, dwarves would be perfect. It's the word craft and we've seen them as survivors on the road. And so that really fit. And then we started to figure out, well, what's a What's the, we didn't want to just say it's Lord of the Rings and it's doors. We wanted a story that had some stakes to it. And that's when we we went through and it's like, well, what would be important to the dwarves that wasn't something we'd a story we'd already seen before? And that's when yeah. we hit on he talks in the appendices of about eventually they get everybody together and and go back to Moria. And then then we wanted to think about for people that love the books, for people that love the movies and they get into this, how who who would tell them? Hey, go do this cool adventure and they would listen and so that's when it all kind of like lined up it was like okay well moria well if we do moria that means the fourth age and then if it's the fourth age when do we set it so everyone's still around mm -hmm. uh and that's when we we kind of landed on it it all just sort of felt natural that well it needed to be gimli and then we started to think about what would be gimli more in the twilight more in the winter um and we we were so sort of focused on kind of writing it out and figuring out how the game would work and working on the game. We were having a meeting, I think it was last year at this point with the folks at Middle Earth Entertainment, um, our licensors, and we were enjoying the game. We were talking and they just said, hey, if you could have anything, don't worry about how hard it would be. If you could have anything, what would you have that would make the game better? And we were like, well, the, I just kind of blurted it out. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, if you could get John Reese Davis to be Gimli again, that would be great. But I don't know if that's really possible. <laughs> um, and, and so I was sort of like fanboyed out for a moment. Um, and they were like, well, we'll make a few few phone calls. And then I think it was within a week we had heard from uh, uh, from John's people that that it was possible. And then we were we went back. And we we're like, oh, we should have written a lot more for Gimli. <laughs> be cool now. Um, but I'm actually glad we it be, that it was something that happened late because then we were a little more constrained like we were a little more restrained with it because otherwise it it could have very easily turned into oh we're, we're gonna get mr east davies let's make it a buddy comedy 100 hours <laughs> of just hanging out with with gimli uh but, and but what's then, wrong like, what's <laughs> wrong with 100 hours of of hanging out with gimli eh? i was gonna say that sounds now pretty that you fun say it, now, now that I feel, I feel like maybe that's the sequel <laughs> well um, you know i mean it, it is about taking a group of people back to recover our civilization, to recover our dwarfish inheritance, and to bring the glory of the war of the dwarves back into the world again. I I think that's a great setup. You know, if if John tells me to, you know, go reclaim a mountain, I'm probably gonna do it. You know, like I, I was motivated right there, John. Like if you told me right now, exactly, go reclaim. You'd like, come. I'm gonna, I'm You'd doing come. It. I've got, got my it. axe right here. Let's, let's yes. do this. Let's go. Oh, it's yeah. a proper axe too. <laughs> I like it. Very now, good. 
Now I'm curious, John. Do you do you uh, did you get the axe after after playing Gimli? I may have, may have, yeah, may have. I, I may have, mm, may have. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, yeah. John, we've got we've actually got a clip. Now this is the first time this has been shown, and John, I don't think you've seen this yet, but this is actually uh, a cinematic from early in the game that features. Gimli. So I'm going to play this for us here and then uh, we'll get some reaction and talk a bit about it. Yes, dwarves from every clan have answered your call, despite the king under the mountain's objection. Lord Gimli, Erebor will not support entering the Black Pit. If the king wants to stop us, he can come himself. Every attempt you've made has failed. This is a sign. No signs or kings are going to stop us. This is the time to reclaim Khazad Doom. Today, we get into that mountain. Any luck? No, won't budge. Did you try speaking friend? Now, why didn't I think of that before? You did your best. On to plan B. Ah. Finally. Plan B? Is that blasting fire? I'd stand back if I were you. This is madness. Dimly, you can't. We have to wait for Durin. Durin's not here. We have to do this ourselves. Maybe this will wake him up. Limin Barak. Limin Tagaz. Kazad Dashtin! Oh no! Lord Gimli! This is another sign! Oh, hammer tongues! It's the fourth age! Nothing is going to stop us. You heard Lord Gimli? Let's go! Pack it in! It's nice and tight! Come on, help him out! All right. <laughs> so we've we've got uh, a uh, Gimli, like you said, John Paul, in his twilight here. Um, so. He he seems pretty gung ho here, John, to uh, to get back into Moria. Someone has to lead, and it's always a dwarf, <laughs> and a dwarf's dwarf is Gimli, and indeed the finest representatives of the adventurous dwarves, not these cityfied dwarves that sit around and talk about the old times. We're gonna make new times out of the old times. Even if it takes a little bit of gunpowder to do it. Oh, <laughs> there you are. That's all I got to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> now, John Paul, at the at the end of the clip there, I noticed, you know, we get the first person view. I'm assuming that's our playable character, and then us falling into the ground kind of kicks off our adventure. Yeah, the next the next thing you would see would be your character waking up uh, uh on their own in the dark, uh, trying to figure out what's next. Excellent. Um, now, uh, John, I'm I'm curious. Uh, you know how how do you think uh, you know Gimli here differs you know from from the one that we saw you know a after the fall of Sauron and everything. Obviously, he he's looking a little gray there, so he's he's getting a little a uh, little more aged. Um, is, is that you know part of his uh, you know. Uh, motivation to to kind of kickstart these other dwarves like hey let's do this my my clock is ticking here well of course i'm i'm not privy to the to, to the backstory of the game so i i i but my guess would be that i, I rather fancy he comes back from from the ring expedition to find a society that's actually completely I, has anything been going on? What the hell? Where have you been? Have you been doing anything lately, Gimli? <laughs> you know, and and he's looking around in some disgust, and 
and he's still motivated by, you know, he has been there in those halls. He has fought in those halls now. And I think he wants to take it back. He wants to take them back. He wants to refound a civilization, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I don't know whether the writers have come up to that high standard and ideal, but if they haven't, I'm sure they will, won't they? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, one, one of the big one of the big conflicts uh, in the in the backstory is uh, you know Gimli's cousin is the the king in Erebor now yeah. the king under the mountain which would be um, at this point Dane. Thorin. Yeah. Oh, Thorin, yes, Thorin Dane's III. son, Thorin. Yeah, uh, and uh, there's a little bit there with the emissary from Erebor, which is who is kind of trying to convince Gimli to to chill out a bit. Um, okay. And so what you learn is there's a little, there's some back and forth that Gimli was like, it's time, let's do this. And his cousin, the king under the mountain is like, no, we need to wait. We need to wait for this set of signs to, he wanted everything to be right. Yes. And Gimli being Gimli realized that, that the, the people needed to be led and uh, uh, that events needed to be forced forward. And he ultimately, uh, spoiler, ultimately is proven right that, that it was the right time and, and they mm. should have gone in. Um, so. Well, I would expect nothing less than Gimli to be right. Well, of course. Something. Yeah. <laughs> well, of course. When is Gimli ever wrong? <laughs> now, um, John, you mentioned uh, I've, I've seen a lot of fan posts. You know, you've been uh, doing some um, conventions and stuff like that. Uh, and you mentioned, you know, folks coming up to you. Um, are there certain things that, that fans tend to repeat a lot, like uh, things that you hear? A lot, you know, repeatedly. Oh yes, yes, indeed. Um, I, 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 I've, um, you know, don't tell the elf, and uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, certainty of death, small chance of success. What are we waiting for? <laughs> um, yes, he's. He, He's an enchanting little fellow. Uh, the reason why we find him funny is, of course, he doesn't realize he's small. Yes. Uh, yes. Everybody else does, but uh, but he doesn't. He doesn't think of himself as small at all. He yeah. thinks of himself as a giant. And he is a giant. <laughs> yes. Um, but the fans love him, and uh, I'm awfully fond of him. He's a wonderful character, really. Uh, and... Uh, it's it's always fun to come back and 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 think of the what ifs, yeah. Uh, and, and the chance to do this game is a, an exploration of one of the what ifs, isn't it? And yeah. uh, and uh, actors often create characters out of love. Generally, create characters out of love. We fall in love with them, and uh, it's very hard sometimes to let them go. Yeah. Uh, and, and certainly, Gimli is uh, G Gimli is for me uh, a, a character that I really adore, um, uh, and I'm very grateful to the opportunity to to reprise him in a different context. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, he's. I I have been really excited about this yet because I've I've always been a huge fan of of dwarves and obviously of Gimli, you know, the dwarf, as we like to say. Um, so John Paul, what, what kind of, uh, things have you seen, you know, across the fandom as far as excitement to be playing dwarves? Um, there's something about dwarves. I feel like, yeah. And maybe I'm just being super biased right now because I, like, I know if I were in Middle Earth, I would be a dwarf. There's no question in my mind. So I, well, I maybe I'm just biased, but I feel like the opportunity to be dwarves is the most exciting out of all the races. You know, it, it, it's a great question. And one of the things that I think I'm struck by is, uh, John, your description of Gimli, when you were talking about why he's such an interesting character and the more human, that's almost exactly what we hear from players when they talk about dwarves as a whole, that... They feel like they can see themselves as the dwarves. They feel like they can be serious. They can be silly. 
uh, they can project themselves into it, which is a game, you know, you're playing as a character and you want to kind of feel like you are the character while you're playing it. And yeah. so when we made the game and we sat down, we said, well, let's just make everything as dwarfy as possible. Like you don't drink potions, you, you drink ale. You, uh, you don't just like take a bit of food with you, you make a meal and, and, you know, you don't decorate your base with just baubles. You make a pile of treasure and, uh, and people just have really responded to that. And so everything, John, you were saying about, uh, being flawed, but being, you know, having their own sense of humor, all of those things are things that people really kind of get into. And when we say, Hey, it's a game about dwarves everyone jumps in they say I i'm in before we even finish the sentence uh and i'm sure a big part of that is because of course the the uh the love that people have for gimli and what he what he brought to uh to the screen um for sure um now uh john paul uh another question for you that you had a uh, a closed beta recently um yeah. for the game how did how did that go well, we, we invited um, about 2,000 of the community members. So over the course since we announced the game, some of a lot of people have joined our Discord. And it's a really big overlap between people that like games and people that like Lord of the Rings. And um, it's been fun to watch them speculate about what the game would be and what they hoped the game would be. And then when we decided to do the closed beta, we, we wanted really them to get a chance to be the first ones to play it. Uh, so it was two weeks long. It was about a half of the game, maybe a little less than half of the game. Uh, it, it went really well. Um, you know, obviously we got a lot of really good feedback uh, that we've already addressed and, and we come out next week. So, yeah. um, you know, hopefully we did, we got everything that, that people were looking for, but, uh, it was, it was really fun to watch for the first time more than a small group, but a large group get together, play. Um, one of the cool things about the way we did it is, um, anyone on the development team could jump in and watch people play. Um, while they were playing and so it was kind of neat we'd jump in some of us would jump in and we'd be quiet and just kind of watch and then sometimes they'd realize oh dev is here uh and then we would answer lore questions and uh help them out with hints and things like that but uh it was it was really fun it was um really gratifying i think to watch people that have been talking about the game and see them chatting about oh i was right they did have this one character or um oh this is a little different but it wasn't what i thought but it's it's it, neat it, 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 all the same so I, I think it went really well now john do you think uh any of your um castmates any of your lord of the rings alumni are going to be a little jealous that you've returned to middle earth now well, you know, the pointy ears is always a little bit jealous of the talents of the dwarves, eh? Uh, the hobbits, well, actually, the hobbits are are, are very, very popular, and 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 yeah. they tour they as do. as little groups of hobbits. It's like a uh, like a pond full of hobbits. Sometimes, you know, um, I I think. Uh, uh, no, they won't be jealous. <laughs> they won't be jealous. <laughs> a pointy ear, maybe. You yeah, know. maybe. Well, you can. Yeah. You never put it past the pointy ear. Well, you never. They're, you know, yeah. he's, he's, he's you very. You just never know what they're going to do. He's very competitive, okay. and he doesn't like to be beaten. Which, when he's mm -hmm. uh, when he's comparing right, himself for, with with, with, a, with me, you know, he always gets beaten. Oh, doesn't there he? we go. There we go. What did I freeze up there? <laughs> no, you're fine. Oh, okay. Did I, 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 did I freeze? Fun. No, no. I think it, I I froze. It like refreshed on me there. Hmm. Um, Nothing like a frozen dwarf, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so take us back to the uh, the sessions that you had. You know, getting in the sound booth again, John. Um, what what uh, did you did you have any? You know. Uh, particular favorite lines or um, fun moments from the sound recording? Oh, yes. You always have fun in a sound recording because, I mean, because because the people who've written the lines are often listening in and you want to make them laugh and you want to make, you want, in some ways, it is that encounter with the actor, particularly an, an actor who has actually created the character on film um 
that that's that can be very stimulating to them and that can that can feed them and and that's necessary but you know we all know that in our in our business it's not a great solo performance that wins it's it's a combination of of so many people working together to create the same thing uh and uh and 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 one of the jobs of the actor in a situation like that is to stimulate the writers and make them think oh wait a minute we could do and they do and they have fun and they need fun those poor little things <laughs> stuck in a studio trying to make sort of odd endless lines of little little thingies possibles happen on those computery thingies that nobody else understands or frankly cares about. <laughs> right. So I take it you're a big time video game player than John. <laughs> oh, yeah, all the time. I have, I have nothing better to do than sit in this shop. They're ignoring these wonderful works of literature than to sit down and play a bloody game on a computer. Huh? We dwarves are active creatures, active in the mind as well as in the mind. That's a good <laughs> I like line. That yeah. that is a good line. Yeah, we're gonna have to add that to the. Uh, we'll write that down. The, yeah, that we'll write that down. That'll be uh, in the expansion pass. Mm -hmm. You know. <laughs> now, um, John Paul, you're telling me about uh, mm. some some of John's improvised lines. So you also not only get get to hear what you know yeah. what you've written. Uh, performed by John, but uh, you know John brings that that flair of uh, of Gimli that only he can. Yeah, uh, the um, the one line that comes to mind is when the the emissary um, sort of naively asks, hey, "Did you try speaking friend to open the door?" Uh, and uh, John did a bunch of different versions of them, uh, and I was glad he did because uh, what we he landed on the the oh why didn't I think of that before? Just it felt so perfect. Uh, so that one, I, I think it was a much more straight, like, no, we got this kind of a thing. And then John, I think, read it the first time cold and just went right into like sarcasm. And we were like, <laughs> well, that's so much better <laughs> than what we had. Um, so we were able to make that line a little bit more of a chuckle, uh, like a little more of a laugh line than, than it originally was, um, which is great because I think that was probably again, like John said about like being in the actor who being with the actor who created the character you know, it reminded us we needed to make sure we had a little bit more of the humor uh, of Gimli in there. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think that's that's part of the reason that I can relate to dwarves because, you know, there's that sarcastic element, which is like a second language to me sometimes. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the uh, And then when we were doing, and we didn't show it, but obviously the end of the game, um, which I don't want to, I don't want to spoil the end of the game. Yeah, but, don't spoil um, the end. Gosh. But one of the things as we were working through recording on the end of the game, um, by the time we got to that part of the recording session, um, on the side, we had realized that, like it was just so like we were just in it, and it felt so great to hear John as Gimli again um, that we we had him um, or we asked him to try improving on a couple of other things that op made everything a little bit more open ended. Mm. Um, so that, that, uh, we basically were like, we got to write more, more for Gimli, uh, as we go into the future and, and just being around it and hearing it, that, that convinced us that we needed to just like double down on Gimli. And so mm. that, that was super fun to do. Yeah, right you can, Thank you. You can never have enough Gimli. Like there's no, no, no. such thing as too much Gimli. You can't have enough. <laughs> it's like... It's like inviting a man to a feast. You know, you want to give him all you have. I mean, the joy of being a dwarf is sharing good ale and 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 salted beef or salted pork, and yeah. you know, dripping, <laughs> dripping with fat. Fat is what gives life flavor. Hmm? Remember yes. that. Huh? <laughs> now. Now, John, you you of course also did the voice of Treebeard. We talked a bit about that last time uh, you were on the show. Um, I it, was this kind of a similar experience to what you did to to create the Treebeard character. I would Tree imagine that was a lot of sound sound booth as well. Peter said 
would you like to do Treebeard? And I said, oh, jolly good, yes. Another easy bit of money to be made on this one. <laughs> and then I really started. I still wake up at night, at night sometime thinking, I don't know how to play this part. I, I do not believe that I got it right. I created something, but I haven't got it right. And I don't know how to do it. How do you, what is the noise that comes from a walking, talking tree? I mean, it doesn't have lungs. So I tried, you know, I, tr I tried everything. We tried very high, very high notes. But the thing that you can't do is get his slowness. Mm. You know, you yeah. can, when you read the book, you can, you can sense the slow and dilatory nature of the mm, mm, But you can't do that in film, you know. You, you, it's very odd. Our sense of time when we read mm, yeah. shifts and changes according to the words. Our sense of time in film is, is very much sort of second by second. Yeah. It's more fixed, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I still don't know how to do it. Um, well, you, and I, you, so you mentioned that last time you were here, and I, just so you know, there was a lot of comments on that video that, you know, far be it for me to disagree with John Rhys Davies, but I think you did a marvelous job as Treebeard, and a lot of people adore Treebeard and think you did a wonderful job, so... He's what he's a wonderful character, but I still don't know how to do him properly. Um, and I've never had that, I've never had that before where you, you know, sometimes you do a job and you think, Oh, stupid, I missed that point, I missed that, I missed that. I, I really, I found myself working harder on Treebeard, and we had session after session trying to find the right way to do it, trying to drop the voice down so deep that it was almost like a whale song, you know? We mm. did everything. And uh, and yet, I don't, I don't wake up thinking, ah, I should have done it that way. I mm. wake up thinking, I don't know how to do this. <laughs> um, it's a tough nut to crack. Yeah. Yeah. Now, was um, was what, sliding back into Gimli? Was that, I mean, that, I, I I think you've shown and demonstrated it's pretty easy for you to slide back into Gimli. Oh, yes. Gimli, Gimli is, uh, well, I don't, Gim there, there, it seems like quite a blurred line between John Reese Davies and Gimli, I think. You like, think? Yeah. I you think? <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> One of the great things about being an actor is that you get to inhabit these wonderful characters and 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 in not just inhabit them, but they become part of you and you, a bit of you becomes part of them. Uh, and it's sometimes hard to see where one ends and the other begins, really, sometimes. I, I love Gimli. I think uh, I think there's a great... You know, the, there's that. There's a great integrity. There's a great self belief. Yeah. There's sometimes doubts. I think that when he's, you know, when he, there may be that hint in the back of his mind that perhaps he is not quite as equipped as the Strider and 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 the Elf when running long distances in mountains. But he wouldn't give up. Right. You know. But there may just be a little fog of doubt lurking in the 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 deepest recesses of the. Uh, am I up to this? Yes, of course I am. You know, <laughs> gosh, we dwarves are, are, are natural sprinters. You know, uh, very dangerous over short distances. <laughs> Subnote: Maybe not quite so good over the long distances. <laughs> Dear God, can we stop for a bit of... No, we can't. Fine. I'm going to show them that we dwarves can keep up with anybody at any time because there is nothing a dwarf cannot do. <laughs> oh, 
(laughs) (sighs) (sighs) Now, I would imagine another perk of returning to Gimli in voiceover faction is no bloody makeup. Oh, yes. (laughs) Yes. And I have to say that looking at the... uh, the minds of Moria, Gimli. He doesn't quite have as much makeup on as I did. Huh? Yes, yeah. No, and, and you saw the return of the king, all those dwarves in there. <laughs> I'll tell you exactly what happened there. They, uh, the studio boss said, all right, I love it. Yeah, we'll have another trilogy. Well, it's a very small book. Nevertheless, I want a big, I want a big film. <laughs> now, tell me about the women in it. There are no women in it. What do you mean there are no women in it? <laughs> well, well, sir, you have read Of course I've read the damn thing. Yeah, of course I have. <laughs> yeah, but um, you know, just just, just remind me, because I've got a lot of projects on at the moment. Um, remind me now. Uh, who's the leading man? Well, it's not really a man. It's, it's, it's a dwarf, in fact. Oh, what do you mean? It's the dwarf? I mean... There are 13 of them. 13 of them? What? 13 <laughs> people looking like John Reese Davis and no women? That won't work. That's not my trilogy. I want women. I want succulent, young, elvish women. Stick them in, will you? I'm sure that Tolkien would approve. Um, <laughs> I, 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 and, and dwarves? Well, come on now. 13. That's, that's very, look. If, if, if seven was enough for Walt, I understand why, right? <laughs> We're not having 13 people looking like John Reese Davis. Find me two handsome young dudes, <laughs> put a tiny bit of makeup on them, and screw the rest. It doesn't matter about the rest. Just give me, give me what I want, and I want a trilogy, okay? I want money. I want a trilogy. I want mm, some women. In, I want some love interest in it, okay? No. Speaking of love interest, I was talking to John Paul, and he claims that Mr. John Rhys Davies is lobbying for a Mrs. Gimli to well, make an appearance in the game. Well, I don't know about a Mrs. Gimli, but you know, a, pros- a Miss Prospective Gimli. Miss- oh, oh I mean, yeah, you know, we got to get an arc in there. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely, okay, story. <laughs> absolutely, because you know, once I met that. That beautiful queen, some part of my heart will never be arrested. And yet I know pragmatically that you cannot covet an elf. I'm certainly not an elvish queen of that beauty. And part of her glory and part of her beauty will remain forever in my heart. And yet a dwarf a dwarf must meet and marry and make future dwarves, make future heroes to come. But I've I've not yet I've not yet met someone who can fill my heart with the joy and the love and expectation that I had when I met her, Galadriel. Galadriel the Golden. I have three hairs of my head, you know. That's right. Yeah. Now, have you, I, I'm curious, John, have you ever seen that? This just came to mind, so I pulled it up real quick. Have you ever seen from the Hobbit trilogy, they actually did a concept art piece with uh, Kate Blanchett as uh, a dwarf. So you can actually see, have you ever seen this before? Never seen it. Okay. Never. So this is Kate Blanchett who famously played Galadriel as a dwarf. So so if Gimli were to meet a handsome dwarf like <laughs> like uh Kate's dwarf here, I I feel like that would be a potential good fit. The problem is you see that um what what the problem is that dwarfish women have beards. Now, if I He's got a little if, bit, a little bit there. Well, I don't know about that. You see, I, 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 as I see it, what I'm looking for is a freak, really, in dwarfish <laughs> nature. You know, I want a beardless dwarf now, a, a beardless, uh, 
and 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 we would know that such a creature would be an outcast in our society or yeah. a, a, a figure of ridicule, perhaps. But I have seen glory and beauty, and it re remains forever to me a standard that 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 maybe we dwarves are not capable of understanding. Yeah. Mm. Anyway, but yes, were I to see a Galadriel amongst the dwarves, my bond to the true Galadriel would be cemented in a way. Yeah. You cannot have a queen that belongs to somebody else. That's true. You cannot, you cannot take another man's wife, even an elf's wife. Yeah. That's frowned upon. Yes. Very much. Uh, <laughs> that's not, yeah. I don't think Tol that's, that's a, that would have to be a different book series. That's not in the, the Tolkien uh, sphere, I believe. No. Um, like what, one of one of my favorite details in the cinematic that we showed was um, actually having the the bearded. strands of hair around oh. Gimli's neck. And, oh, yeah. Uh, so uh, if you when we if you go back and look at it, you can actually see um, he's carrying it around with him. That was a, an important detail. And it yeah. looked like he also maybe had a crown uh, on his on his belt there. Yeah, the the um, he he keeps getting called Lord and doesn't really like being called lord he doesn't really think he still thinks of himself as a member of the fellowship even if he has created a whole new dwarven realm at the glittering mm. caves at this point so he's got like a little it's not a king crown but a little like sort of like lord circlet and he doesn't want to wear it he's just <laughs> kind of holding it he's like yeah i gotta have this thing but it's it's not i'm not gonna put it on my head so i i'm curious you know go, going back to the recording session so uh john how much time have you uh been in the recording studio for the game oh i don't know a couple of hours so far and uh okay. it look, looks as if i've got a couple of hours to come doesn't it mm -hmm. yeah at, so when we're recording least. this you'll be here in a few here in a few days you'll be recording uh a bit more um so yeah they're so building we... they're building the part because they've got the idea yeah you know this is about <clears throat> This is about a dwarf leading his people back into their possessed land, driving out the demons, the Balrogs, the other bits and pieces that get in the way, and reclaiming a lost land, a lost world. Perhaps reclaiming something that, well, perhaps we will actually see Dorim come mm. out of his sleep one day. But we will only do that when we deserve our Dorim. Aye, and you look I... at the youngsters today. Do they deserve it? <laughs> no, they don't. Why? Because they haven't. I don't mean to I don't mean to con criticize in any way my cousin Torin. He's a he's a great <laughs> king. He's a great king. Well, he's probably in an, busy in an undynamic sort of way. In an undynamic sort of way, he's 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 more inward looking. He is more status quo, and I am status pro. <laughs> hmm, that's a good line. Remember that. Is, that. That's, hey. that's two. Oh, okay. Two good lines we've got right now. Right, right, right. We're on a roll today. <laughs> um, now, uh, John Paul. Um, mm -hmm. Oh shoot. I lost it. Uh, give me one second here. Oh, uh, don't worry. I know where it is. Yes. <laughs> yes. Go back a page. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, That's it. Here. Very good. <laughs> Keep looking. Keep looking. It's like mining, you know. Sometimes, it is. Sometimes you've got to chip away. I know. And, and if, you're, if you're too heavy with the axe... You can destroy something perfect. But if you chip away too slowly, you never get there. <laughs> Finding that balance <laughs> is one of the miners' problems. Well, yeah. What I, I would definitely not uh, compare my notes for, 
for any of my streams to to perfection for sure. Um, <laughs> so well, that, uh, that we can agree on. That yes. we can agree on. Yes. <laughs> now, yeah. uh, John, John Paul, um, what what kind of uh, things can people expect? You know, after Gimli has has set us forth on this path, mm -hmm. we're going to reclaim Moria. So what what can we expect? to do and for those of you who don't know this is a cooperative game so you can actually team up with people play online together and band together to to you know survive and and go on this quest to reclaim moria so john paul what what kind of things now that we're a week out from release you know when when people fire up the game what can we expect yeah, so we, we saw at the end of that cinematic, uh, your character uh, in the midst of an accident and, and w then waking up in the dark in Moria. So there is a story that you'll follow along of what's actually happening, you know, uncovering the mystery of why couldn't they just speak friend and open the door? Why was it so hard? What was going on? Who is the power or the force uh, of evil and shadow that is inside Moria now? And it's a, I think it's a bit of a surprise. Uh, and then gameplay wise, you are, you know, as we say with survival crafting as a genre, uh, you're basically you start enough kind of like on your own or with your friends, but you don't have anything. But the dwarves are uh, great craftsmen. So it's uh, mining for resources, building yourself a base or a fortress, fighting orcs, uh, and then exploring through Moria and un uncovering that mystery and then eventually figuring out, OK, we got to get back out. But why do we want to get back out and what? Uh, not only why isn't the door opening and who's in there, but starting to explore a bit of the philosophy of the dwarves, maybe what they think of themselves. Um, you know, the first lines um, of the game is John as Gimli saying, everything you know about us has been told to you by the elves and the hobbits. This is a chance to tell the story ourselves. And so you learn what do the dwarves think of themselves, not what do the elves think of the dwarves. Uh, and then eventually kind of uncover a bit of why has their luck been so bad uh, mm. for the last thousand years? Now, if you touched on, you know, why are we going through the the doors of more? Yeah, the doors of door in there. And I, I actually thought that at first. I was like, why wouldn't they go on the other end? And then it clicked in my mind, of course, like, Oh yeah, the bridge of Casa Doom was destroyed. So there's kind of a uh, a big gap there to cross. So so Gimli here has opted obviously for the uh yeah. the, let me tell you, the western side. Let, let me tell you, even Strider couldn't have thrown me across that gap. No. Trust me rather. No. One of the most shaming things in my life being <laughs> tossed. And I bet he did tell the elf. Because I, they like to have a little snigger behind my back. I'm sure. <laughs> now Vico's a pretty strong guy, but but John, like you're you're pretty tall guy yourself, pretty big guy. Do you think Vigo could actually toss you? What do you mean? Nobody tosses a dwarf. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody. I mean, if uh, that was just you know, that'd be that was... an interesting thing to see him attempt, though. I don't. know. <laughs> Vigo actually is 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 such an all round capable man. You know he's he's um. Did you see that thing that he did with Michael Douglas? That three hander where he's having an affair with Douglas's wife, and Douglas persuades him yes. uh, to kill the woman. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, Gwyneth Paltrow is the one. Mm -hmm. There's a tiny little moment in the film where, where, where Vigo, as the young artist, uh, we see inside his studio. Those are Vigo's paintings. Really? Yes. Vigo, mm -hmm. Vigo has exhibited his art internationally. Vigo is also a pretty world-class and exhibited photographer. Mm. Yeah. He's a he's a damn good writer and poet, uh, and and of course he's a he's a wonderful actor, wonderful yeah. star, but he's a great individualist and a great a great Renaissance character in his own right. Yeah, I love I love him I love him to death. He's just fantastic, and um, and if anyone could 
toss a dwarf. Not that anyone would dare try. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but if anyone could toss a dwarf, it would be it would be Vigo. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that I had to look it up because I recalled that movie. It's called A Perfect Murder for anyone yeah. in the in the chat room or watching here that's curious. Actually, I saw it way back and then it was years later after seeing Lord of the Rings that you know it, it I found out that he was in it and everything clicked and it's like, "Oh, I have, you know, that's where I've seen him before." Um you also yeah. saw him in in GI Jane. Oh. Yeah. He's the, he's the nasty guy that's actually raping her at the end and whom she <laughs> hits back. She she he's he's the you know, he's the one huh. who doesn't he doesn't believe that a woman can possibly do this job. Yeah. Because a woman doesn't actually understand torture and the sort of press mm. pressure she would be in. Um, he's a good actor, good, good actor. And, uh, uh, I love him. To, I love him to death. There's a, there's a good quality of mind about Vigo that yeah. I find admirable. Mm. Now, now, have you, uh, do you have any, um, favorites among, you know, your former cast members of Lord of the Rings that, you know, projects oh. they've done in the years since or even before? Oh yes, I mean uh, all of them. Are, all of them are really sort of developing their own careers, and uh, you know, I, I I see little, I see performances from time to time, and think, oh, good, good, good. Um, they are, they were a superb cast. Mm. I, you know, as as the casting goes, that film was perfectly cast. Yes. There was one character in it and one performance in it when I saw the uh, w when I saw the early cut I went to PJ and said this isn't good enough. It's not working. And uh and he looked at me in that sort of directorially way. <laughs> when I saw the final cut and it had been revoiced by the actor himself um and it was not one of the fellowship, let me tell you. Um, it was marvelous. Mm. It was just, there is not a performance in there that I think is in any way substandard. No. There's not a performance no. there that I would have, that, you know, that you wouldn't have given your eye teeth to give. Yeah. Actually. It's remarkable. It's, yeah. how how great that cast is i so i'm actually going to have uh liz Mullane, the casting director on uh probably here in a few weeks um to chat with her a little bit um about the casting but that's that's something that's always blown my mind about uh those lord of the rings films is how incredibly well it just seems like everybody they picked it's like they were they were made to play those roles yeah yeah, and, but then that is the characteristic of a good, of a good actor. Yeah. That you know, you say, "Well, we're picking him for this role," but after he's done it, you can't think of the role in in any other way. Yeah, you know, that's there are definitive performances from time to time, and uh, and and I think that that cast gives them really yeah, yeah it's it's to the point where it would be hard to picture just about anyone in any of those roles other than the people who played them in those films that's right yes and yeah, then there are, there are no holes in those in, in, in there's no hole in the hole in terms of performance and characterization i think it's just terrific and jackson is a genius mm, yes you know this uh, I hope it's not his only masterpiece, um, because he's got he's got a lot more up his sleeves. But oh, absolutely, I, I actually found I I found the Hobbit. I was glad I chose not to be in the Hobbit. Um, mm. I I think I think the pressure of the studios, yeah, was was too great, and uh, it would have been. 
it, it would have been a better film had it been a little bit shorter, I think. Yeah. Well, I think the timeline to like comparing the production timeline, pre-production and production timelines of Lord of the Rings versus the Hobbit. It's pretty clear, you know, they were, they were on a much tighter timeline with the, you know, circumstances wow. with, you know, Guillermo del Toro had to back out. Peter had to step in and yeah, it, it, I, I wish they they could have given him more time on the front end too. Yes, yes, indeed. And uh, and Del Toro is a brilliant director. Yes, and he would have yeah. given he would have given s s something unique mm -hmm. and different. Uh, uh, and uh, I mean, they just wasted three years of a great director's life mm. as they as they they squabbled over how much of the proceeds they could divide amongst themselves. You know, there's anyway. I I, I should be more restrained in my <laughs> in, in, in my criticism, but you know, Del Toro is one of the great innovative directors of his age and absolutely to, to squander creativity like that is well it, it it's a sin against the holy spirit really isn't it um uh, I mean, it's a real shame that. yeah it's it's yeah. one of those that like you you acknowledge yes it's a business and business things are going to happen and stuff but there's there's also you know from from the more uh human element i think you you look at it and you think that is a shame you know he could have been yeah, making that was, making that more was, magic during that time exactly exactly and uh it's an opportunity cost that only he bears really mm -hmm. he, i mean it's like taking three uh, years out of a man's a creative sort of momentum that you're getting yeah. uh, and then it comes to a halt and you're in suspension for three years. Yeah, I, it, it's really unfair and unkind. And uh, I hope I get the chance to work with him one day again. Um, I, I, I just had a bad feeling about about what they were going to do with the Hobbit. The Hobbit is a different book entirely. Lord yeah. of the Rings is a fully fledged masterpiece. Yes, yeah. Uh, 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 um, the Hobbit is a lovely light preface yes. to mm -hmm. it, and and you you know you can't have the same expectations for for the, for for a light preface. Yes, a, yeah. The Hobbit it's is a children's it, tale. Yeah, it's a children's yeah. tale. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but um, but I'm glad that it it was still wetter. I was glad it yeah. was still shot in New Zealand. Yes. And uh, so yeah, I better shut up. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm curious. Uh, you know, you you bring up the the Hobbit, and then of course, you know, there's there's been uh, announcements that. Uh, Warner Brothers is going to be making more films. The rumor is that there's going to be three more uh, kind of standalone films. There's a uh, Rohirrim animated film coming up next December. And then we've got uh, the Rings of Power Amazon show all going on. So it's, it seems like there's a lot of, you know, Middle Earth on the horizon. You know, hopefully, hopefully it doesn't get too much and we, you know, I, I always hope for quality over quantity when it comes to to adaptations. Um, so, you remember I, I, yeah. you remember Stalin's great saying in terms of war: quantity has a quality of its own. Mm. Um, <laughs> doesn't apply doesn't apply to filmmaking. Um, <laughs> I, I I saw the Amazon thing. I got invited to the premiere, and <clears throat> I. I mean, it was completely different, and you have to treat it as a different thing. Yes, yeah. um, it it isn't Tolkien. Um, it's a riff on a theme of Tolkien, mm -hmm. and if you see it in that light, then you have to judge it as a separate thing. I know for I know a lot of the purists were were just simply saying, you know, it's not Tolkien. Mm. You know, it's 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 about a page and a half of Tolkien. Uh, that's taken yeah. and expanded into a 
into a series, but it's it's a it's a different. The writers have different sensibilities. The writers mm -hmm. are, you know, and they don't have, with all due respect to them, and I do respect them, they don't have the genius yeah. of Tolkien. Um, but, you know, uh, it, it, the benefits to the New Zealand economy uh, are to be appreciated. And, and right. uh, it was a, just a shame that... Uh, the country was so mismanaged that, in fact, they locked it down, and and in the end, Amazon left. Yeah, uh, but that's a, that's another unpopular remark I've made. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the the act of adapting is uh, it, it's a challenge. You know, we, yeah. we from our side kind of did a lot of what you were saying: take a page and a half and try to try to flush it out. Um, yeah, and. But it's a yeah, but it's a different thing in a game, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, when you're creating characters or or or, or adapting characters, I, I I found it a big jump to go from the Galadriel that I knew to mm -hmm. the uh, to the young Galadriel. Yes, um, yeah, yeah, uh, and um, the the elves. The elves were perhaps a little too human. Um, yeah, yeah. I th that was yeah. I, I think that's a pretty common one, you know that that I share as well. It it they they kind of weren't distinct enough, you know. They they could have been swapped out for for humans. Right. It wouldn't really have made much difference. There was no real magic about them, you know, to set them apart as you know the greater beings that they are. They're these immortal yeah. beings yes. that are that are you know. Yeah. in a sense better than than us humans <laughs> yeah and you know the the it feels like the those of us who are fans of lord of the rings have been really kind of blessed in that for a long time it was really just the books and yeah. one or two adaptations of the books and then peter jackson's incredible movie trilogy there really haven't been a lot of derivative works other than games and so it's it's like the first time really for a lot of us to see that other heart and mind come in and and mm, and yeah. uh, build something out, and it, it's an experience I think for all of us to suddenly see. You know, if you if you watch Star Wars or Marvel or any of the other properties, you're kind of used to that yeah. um, of different That's creators true. taking it. And but we only have really what Professor Tolkien gave us. Yeah. And so, like for us making the game, it's really kind of like where do we find that line between something new so that players who are playing the game feel like I'm not just watching Frodo drop the ring in the mountain again or in the volcano again. Um, and that, but also feeling authentic and trying to find the voice. Um, but if you were to take the voice exactly as is and then put it onto your, your screen or your monitor now, it might feel wrong because we've evolved over the 50 years since it was written. And so there's a, it's it's just an interesting challenge and and everybody i think who is a fan has got they've got their own meter of mm -hmm. what is acceptable and their own line and it's the finding that like what's the sweet spot so that you get most people going yeah this feels right and yeah. not going so far over where a lot of people go oh that's not that's not lord of the rings <laughs> anymore uh and, and it's hard uh it, it's definitely a, a challenge and for us mm -hmm. on the game it was about like bringing in experts bringing in community and kind of trying things and saying like, hey, we're thinking of doing this and backing off when people are like, oh, I don't, I don't know if you, go, if you want to go that far. Um, or yeah, that feels right. So, Well, there are, there are still purists um, who believe that, that Jackson's version is a, a travesty of Tolkien, mm. that, yeah. that, that Tolkien would have hated it. Um, I've got an idea that being the man that he was, that he would have said, well, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have done it that way, but then yeah. I didn't do it for a film. Yeah. What you've, what you've done is interesting and entertaining. And, and, uh, I think he would have recognized the, the work and the effort and the genius and perhaps the spirit. Mm -hmm. And he would certainly have appreciated the fact that people who hadn't read the books went and saw the films and then went and read the books. Yeah. yeah. I'm, was... I'm one of those people that, that did yeah. that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah I think uh, it's interesting. Cause I've, I've often brought this up before. I think 
Tolkien, the the storyteller, would would understand more than people usually give him credit for. Mm-hmm. Um, there's actually letters where he he's talking to somebody who wants to adapt Lord of the Rings into, I think it's two films or a single film, something like that. And he actually recommends cutting out Helm's Deep um, entirely, which, you know, if you if you were to make a an adaptation and recommended that that would be base treachery today, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I, 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 I do think, you know, uh, when people ask me like, Oh, if you could ask Tolkien one question, what would it be? And I, I usually do a cop out and I say, no, I, w- I want to watch the Lord of the Rings trilogy with Tolkien and like, you know, get his, his commentary and, and hear his reaction. Cause then, you know, I get a lot more duration with the professor if I do that. And then I also get, get his reaction to the the trilogy so yes. <laughs> that's usually my answer to that yes you you'd want more than one question with him that's right yeah <laughs> then i yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's a total cheat answer to the question but you know it's i feel like it's a good one so <laughs> yeah i i it is interesting you know you talk about adaptations and uh the thing that that i think you know uh john when we i know you're you're a big book guy like myself you're much you know your your collection there is much more impressive than than my humble shelf at the moment, um, but I'm working on it. <laughs> but the the thing that that I always take comfort in with Tolkien that's you know kind of different from all these other you know franchises and everything. Uh, you know, so so if something you know whether it's an animated film or you know a, f- a film or you know the Amazon show, you know when it when it I feel let down, I've always got the books there. And that's why I never get too worked up about, you know, if, if something lets me down, I've always got the books and I, I feel like John, you probably appreciate that being the, uh, the book fan that you are. Yes. But you know, just to harken back on something we were saying about alternative uh, visions of, of Tolkien, but I mean, he actually created a whole genre of, of fantasy literature. Yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, the Shannara Chronicles are inspired, right. very much inspired by Tolkien. And again, there's a different slant on uh, on it. And the elves are a more complicated, uh, and there's more violence, and there's more conflict within within the kingdom that that he that that Terry uh, envisages. Envis- um, yeah, I, I, you know, the father has beget an awful lot of children there. <laughs> yeah, um, and 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 some of them are uh, are pretty strange and very different, but they all their lineage goes back to Tolkien. And hmm. you brought up uh, Shannara. I, if I'm not mistaken, you've got some pointy ears in that thing. I do. I do. I tra- gets gets some pointy ears. I, do you do you get any flack about playing an elf? One of the reasons I took it. No, it's I. I say this. <laughs> I don't really mean it. But one of the reasons I took it <laughs> is that I could stand up and and say, "From dwarf to elf king, eat <laughs> your heart out, Orlando Bloom." <laughs> <laughs> No, it was an he's an interesting character, and he's uh, I, I, where they started it from uh, meant that I I could only do one season anyway. But yeah. but he's um, he's he's a wonderful character. He's very much I think akin to Henry the uh, Fourth, uh, Shakespeare's Henry the mm-hmm. Fourth, um, who, who basically seizes the crown and um, and makes compromises. And and the crown never really sits that comfortably with him. Mm. He's you know he's he's worried about the future a bit. He's worried about he's worried about those endless rebellions, those endless seepages of 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 of, of, of dwarvish and uh, and other angers that come through the kingdom he cannot hold the four kingdoms together um 
But that's, you know, Terry is a, is a master craftsman himself. Uh, but he was obviously, and he admits it openly, that, you know, what inspired him was Lord of the Rings. Yeah. It, as it inspires so many, <laughs> so yeah. many of us. It, it's interesting you mentioned, you know, as as you're talking about the uh, the Elf King there, um, it, it reminds me to bring us back full circle to the game here. You know what what John Paul described with Gimli, where you know he's he's got that Lord's crown, but he it doesn't sit too well, and he's he's got these concerns, and he wants to see, you know, the uh, his people reclaim their their greatest civilization you know the I, I love the idea that you know these other kingdoms like Erebor and what Gimli sets up in the glittering caves in Rohan uh behind Helm's Deep they're you know they they know in their hearts that that that's not their true home you know these as long as they've lived there it's not their true home their true home is where Durin delved Khazad Doom um that they that they need to return to so it's you know that's gimli behind this saying like let's let's do this let's make this happen yes and i think it's a it's it's a it's a wiser and more mature gimli that who's come back uh and he's seen the world and is you can never see your own your own kin and country quite in the same way when you come back and you've seen the world through a different eye you know he's more now um you know the the the, the quest has changed the quest is yeah. now is now come on let's go back and yeah. reclaim let's reclaim uh Casa doom yeah uh, well, it's interesting it be- you you say you know how he's changed after he comes back and i you know i think about how you know he he's just seen aragorn you know bring gondor back mm. and you know it just from a uh you know obviously th- this is stuff yeah. we're, we're kind of filling in gaps here you know of character motivations and stuff that tolkien doesn't explicitly say but you got to imagine someone like gimli uh seeing gondor restored Yes. You know, maybe that that you know sits with him for a while, and and eventually he he kind of has that prompting on his heart, like let's. Yeah. And we let's, uh, and we know, um, you know, Professor Tolkien wrote in the appendix that eventually Gimli's people help rebuild uh, Minas right. Tirith and rebuild the gate of Minas Tirith with Mithril, and so there's only Mithril in Moria. So ah. you could imagine a scene where Gimli. Uh, sort of impulsively promises, oh, don't worry, I'll get you mithril, and then get home and go, oh, uh, you know, there, it's only there. I guess we're going. We, I guess we're going back. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, indeed. Um, that would be. That would be. You want mithril? I know where there's mithril. I'll get you mithril. <laughs> oh, what have I said? What have I done? <laughs> but why not? Why not? You know, if Gondor can be restored. Maybe the kingdom of, of 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 the dwarves can be restored. Now I I'll tell young my cousin Thorin, uh, and I tried to tell him, and <laughs> but you know he's he's got a lot on his plate at the moment, and he doesn't quite have the fire that I that I hope that he, he might get. And what am I going to do in my old age, eh? eh? <laughs> Sit around here and say, when I was looking for the ring, when I was leading all those people, those dwarves, and the, 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 when, when I led the elves and, and, and the hobbits and, and that, you know, funny tall fellow with a hat, funny <laughs> hat, when I took them to destroy the ring, I'm not going to spend my life talking about that. There is much of life left. And and those of us that have big dreams must exercise the body to fulfill them. I look at the younger generation, I think, where's your vision? Where are your dreams? Where are your passions? What? Ask not what dwarftum can do for you. Ask <laughs> what you can do for dwarftum. 
that's a, a good that's line. a that's pretty a, good that's a pretty good line. It's it a good really line rings familiar for some reason, but oh well, yeah, it would be. It would have probably been translated in different languages and different ways because everybody wants a bite of that one, right. don't they? Yes. <laughs> yeah. But, now, um, of course, I I did mention at the top at the top of the stream here, but uh, we are celebrating Durin's Day. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this, John, but there's kind of this dwarven holiday uh, called Durin's Day, and it coincides with from the tale of the Hobbit. We we first learn about it, uh, you know, that that comes kind of at the the end of autumn and the beginning of winter. Um, so I do I do want to wish all of our audience members a happy Durin's Day and remind you that the game does come out in one week from today. So we're we figured, you know, what better way to celebrate Durin's Day than talking all about the dwarves. Um, so, John, were you familiar with the with the fact that there was a a uh, holiday that was Duren's Day? Uh, well, now that you mention it, <laughs> no. But there should have been. And I'm glad there is. It, sh it should be to, on everyone's calendar, I think. I want all of you to find your inner dwarf. <laughs> I want all of you to, to celebrate Durin's Day. Why? Because Durin represents that impulse in us, not for the stars. The elves aspire to the stars, but sometimes, but sometimes we must seek the inner riches. And the riches of the dwarfs are best expressed in the legend and the real truth about the greatest dwarf that ever there was. And I talk not about myself. Second, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> but Dorin, let Dorin be your guide. Let Dorin teach you how to, to be brave and to create to build miracles, to mine the depths of your experience and create glory and beauty. Eh? Dorian's day, Dorian's life shall be your mark. And maybe yeah, a bit of Gimli I, as well, too, you know, because after <laughs> all... I feel like we should just be, like, recording these for the game. Like, I'm all hyped up now <laughs> to, like, go out and mine something. I'm going to start digging up our yard or something right after this interview uh, because I'm just all amped up. <laughs> it can, sometimes mining can be a metaphor. Mm. Mm. Find your inner dwarf first. Whenever you come to those great cruxes and crossroads in life, ask yourself the simple question, what would Gimli do? That's right. <laughs> what would Gimli do? Well, we're going to find out in the game next week what Gimli wants us to do, and that is reclaim Moria. John Paul, so remind us what, what platforms the game is on, where folks can uh, pre-order the game. Yeah, October 24th will be on the Epic Store for PC, and we'll be on PlayStation 5. Perfect. Yeah, so guys, go, go pre-order the game. You'll be able to jump on, play with your friends, which I think is a huge thing, John Paul. That was a huge thing You know, I know for me. Yeah. To get me excited about the game is that I'll be able to team up with other fellow dwarf lovers. Yeah, we're um, on PC up to eight players and on PlayStation 5 up to four players. Uh, awesome. So, uh, yeah, get in, get a team. Uh, and the game is, you know, going through Moria by yourself is one experience. And then going through it with eight, uh, you know, with seven other dwarves and a group of eight is uh, a whole different kind of jolly experience. Uh, so you can really choose. Do you want a scary, dark experience or you want the like the kind of crazy eight dwarf experience uh so there's a lot packed in i think i think i want both experiences i think i'm gonna do both yeah <laughs> now uh john final question for you last time we you had some really good uh book recommendations so i'm curious at what have you read lately do you have any good book recommendations for for our audience members here there's a lot of good history, good Roman history being uh, being written at the moment. Um, but what else would I really, really recommend? Right on the moment, I'm I'm working on a script that I cannot talk about, mm. and I'm into very much into uh, into that pre First World War and and Second World War German experience, mm. and it is quite extraordinary. The, uh, the there's a splendid book 
called The Warlords, which is about Ludendorff and Hindenburg. And the other day I found uh, online a, a portrait of Hindenburg, which I have purchased, which I'm having restored. It is enormous. It's about, it's, it's two meters tall and about a meter and a half wide. Oh and it's, Hinden, it's Hindenburg as Chancellor of Germany, the second Chancellor of Germany after, the, after Kaiser Wilhelm had abdicated. Um, what's interesting about it is it is probably war loot. It was probably saved by a British army officer who found his, who found his, his men taking pot shots at it and driving bayonets through it. It has bayonet holes oh. and bullet, bullet holes in it. So I'm having it restored a little bit, hmm. um, and, uh, but I want to keep some of the wartime, uh, the bullet holes uh, and the bayonet holes. Yeah. Because because it tells about how people felt. Yeah. That's Hidden, quite a big portrait. Where, oh, yes. Yeah. Where Huge. on earth are you going to put it? Good question. Um, <laughs> good qu I'm working on it. I'm working on it. No, I, I'm, I'm going to have to clear a few walls and yeah. um, but put it up there. But it's it, I, I would imagine it was taken from, you know, perhaps a a major town hall or a city hall, yeah. you know, where it stood there. That's, that is the chancellor. Um, but Hindenburg is, is such an interesting character himself. I mean, Hindenburg is heir to all the general staff people that really started from actually before Frederick the Great of Prussia. And they used Prussia to unify all the German states into one country, Germany. And once they got that, then they they decided that they would lay out modern Germany to fight wars. We want railways, we're going to put railways in. But you have to have a marshalling yard there by the Austrian border because we may want to move troops from there quickly to the Russian border. And we know we're going to have to fight the French again. So we need something up by the Belgian border because that's the way we can get into France behind their line of defenses. We will go through Belgium. The whole of modern Germany was laid out to, make, to enable a European war to be fought and won. Mm. And, uh, and Hindenburg himself destroys the Russian army in the first few weeks of World War I, the Battle of Tannenberg. He virtually wipes out the Russian army. You know, uh, he's, he's a great warlord. And after, after the socialist comes in, after the abdication of the king, because, because, because Germany is in such tumult, they don't believe they've lost the war. Mm. They think they the peace has the armistice has it was meant to be an equal armistice. They thought mm. uh, they don't realize that they have actually had to surrender and they don't accept it. And uh, and uh, and the, the the socialist comes in basically because there's a there's a, a a socialist revolution going on in Russia, and and Germany itself is divided between those who believe, you know believe in communism and those who don't and mm. uh, and the socialist is a compromise he dies and then Hindenburg the the great warlord himself becomes chancellor the second chancellor and under him obviously there's this under this supreme field marshal there's a young corporal who rises up and basically takes over Germany. Uh, he's a very complicated character, but he's a very minor character in the script that I'm writing, but it, I just mm. I just saw the scene when I saw the uh, when, when, when I saw the portrait. Wow. Um, oh, sorry, that's really apropos of nothing. Isn't no, it? that that's I I never have too strict of a framework, you know, when I when I plan these interviews and I was like I'm talking to John today like I'm I'm not even concerned about what what 
tangents we go on. It's just a delight always. <laughs> You're very kind. I, I, I will say you've inspired me that I, you know, you're talking about your two meter portrait that you got. I, I kind of think maybe in the background here, I'm going to put a two meter portrait of Gimli. I feel like that would be a nice addition. Oh, well, I yes. Think, yeah. I mean, I you can't go wrong. You can't go no. wrong with Gimli. Absolutely. And I, I think John Paul, I mean, we're, we're, I know we're a week away from release and we're giving you a lot of ideas today, but I think when I'm making my dwarven home in Moria, Mm-hmm. I should be able to put a portrait of Gimli on the <laughs> wall. That's so such a great idea. Maybe that's maybe that's an update to come for the game, but just I'm just gonna throw it out there, you know. Yeah, see, he's he can got, John can I'm, pose for you. I've got the I've got the helmet just over there. I could go and get that, but I oh. better not know. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we did that last time anyway. We had the helmets yeah, we on last time. That we, was did, great. we did. We did. We did. <laughs> It's a, great, it's a great idea. I love the idea of the dwarves kind of surviving in the dark and then taking a break and just they're going to do a little oil painting. <laughs> you need your arts and crafts time. It's a good de-stressor, you know, to... Well, you know, norm, it's, normally it's jewelry we get into, you know. You know, I'm... It's a, it's a mosaic. I, 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 a, man, I, a man called Peter Jackson suggested to me that that perhaps when I got these strands of a golden hair... I build a box, you know, with sort of a crystal clear surface like that, and mm. suspend these in it, and with lots of ornamentation, you know, bling. I think he's called it. But I saw <laughs> that as gold, as silver stones, wonderful stones, diamonds, rubies, pearls, uh, emeralds, uh, dotted all over the place. Just, just to give it a bit of zhuzh, you know. Uh, <laughs> hmm. Yes, but. Um, but I, 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 I took his point that perhaps it might, this word bling I hadn't heard of before, but um, hmm, it, it didn't sound quite majestic enough for the design of a dwarf. Yeah. I'm still working on that cabinet, by the way. The damn thing is, you know, <laughs> they're, they're, they're very fine hairs. And uh, I mean, I, 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 yeah, well, it's private what I do with the hair, but. Um, <laughs> God, she was beautiful. God, she is. She has a place in my heart always. Or maybe I lost my heart in Merk Wood when I saw her. Well, I didn't really see her in Merk Wood, but I, I could have seen her in Merk Wood. In Lorian, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and folks, as a special treat here to conclude our time with Mr. John Reese davies today, Uh, He has very kindly agreed to read an iconic part from when the Fellowship is in Casa Doom, and that is the Song of Durin. The world was young, the mountains green. No stain yet on the moon was seen. No words were laid on stream or stone when Durin woke and walked alone. He named the nameless hills and dells. He drank from yet untasted wells. He stooped and looked in Miromir and saw a crown of stars appear as gems upon a silver thread above the shadow of his head. The world was fair, the mountains tall in elder days before the fall of mighty kings in Nargothrond and Gondolin, who now beyond the western seas have passed away. The world was fair in Durin's day. A king he was on carven throne, in many pillared halls of stone, with golden roof and silver floor, and rooms of power upon the door. The light of sun and star and moon in shining lamps of crystal hewn, undimmed by cloud or shade of night. 
there shone forever, fair and bright. There hammer on the anvil smote, there chisel, clove, and graver wrote. There forged was blade and bound was hilt, the delver mind, the mason built. There burial, pearl and opal pale, and metal wrought like fish's mail, buckler and corset, axe and sword, and shining spears were laid in hoard. Unwearied then were Durin's folk, beneath the mountain's music woke. The harpers harped, the minstrels sang, and at the gates the trumpet rang. The world is grey, the mountains old, the forge's fire is ashen cold, no harp is rung, no hammer falls, the darkness dwells in Durin's halls. The shadow lies upon his tomb in Moria, in Khazad Doom. But still the sunken stars appear in dark and windless middle mere. There lies his crown in water deep, till Durin wakes again from sleep. That was wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much, John. <laughs> Will that do? Is that yes? Oh my gosh, that was that was incredible. I was getting goosebumps. Um, good, good. And I I know that uh, I appreciate you do. I know it's it was kind of lengthy this time but i know fans will absolutely freak out uh hearing that iconic uh poem that gimli recites all right well thank you so much john paul thank you so much john for for joining me today um i really appreciate both of you taking time out and uh and talking about the return of gimli i know we're all super pumped to not only play as dwarves but to be sent on this adventure by gimli is extra special and even more extra special is to have Mr. John Reese Davies returning to the role as Gimli. Uh, I think I speak for all fans when I say, John, welcome back. We are so, so excited to, uh, to hear you voice this character again. It's wonderful. Uh, I, I love the fans and I love the fact that they love a character that I love too. Gimli is, is, is really us in a way and and i guess that you game players become gimli live up to it lads <laughs> live up to it and lasses oh yeah. there's many a lass that wants to be a dwarf i love that we all have and we'll all have beards <laughs> and i and they yep, all lads and lasses <laughs> lovely wonderful god bless you all all right, thank folks. You. Well, thank you again, and thank you, everyone, uh, for watching. Remember, the game comes out in one week, uh, so be sure to get your pre-orders in so you're ready to dive into Kaza Doom and uh, help Gimli reclaim Moria. Um, and also, have a wonderful rest of your Durin's Day, and we will see you next time on Nerd of the Rings. <laughs>